Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick, and I'm from the Chavi User Group Switzerland. Tonight with me is Tomasz Lelek. He's from Data Stocks, and he's also an author. He has, he's writing currently a book on software mistakes and trade-offs, and that's why he is having a talk with us on mistakes and trade-offs when optimizing the hot path. So I'm really looking forward to the presentation and getting some insights on how doing things the right way when you write software, when you design systems and so on. So I'm just like telling you a few things um, from the administrative perspective as usual, and then I will hide myself afterwards. So as you know, we have the, the chat on the right side of Big Marker. Please use it if you have technical problems. Um, Marcus will help you there as well. And if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A section. The Q&A section is very helpful because we can like categorize the questions, you can vote them up, and it helps us afterwards to prioritize the questions. So Tomas will do the talk in one go and we'll do the Q&A part at the end. So that means like I will ask the questions afterwards. So maybe you want to use the chat and already say hello from where you're joining, or maybe you want to share other things like during the talk with your colleagues or other participants. So just like do that. And I'm fast now because I'm just going directly to the next events. I'm just like letting you know we have a few more events coming up soon. So one will be about JavaX Measure, and it's about this measure parts inside the Java platform, how you can do that. And also we will have a on-site talk about Java 17 in Lucerne. So make sure you can participate in one of the other as well. But I'm done already with the introduction because I wanted to keep it short. Tomas, the stage is yours and I will now make your screen big. Okay, so uh, I'm assuming that everything is uh, working now. Uh, so uh, welcome to mistakes and trade-offs presentation and we'll see how optimizing the hot path, uh, what's, what's op what is optimizing the hot path and when premature optimization becomes early optimization. Uh, so my name is Tomasz Lelek. I am working at Data Stacks. Also, I'm published author of Social Mistakes and Trade-Offs, Making Good Programming Decisions for Manning. Uh, the book, all the chapters in the book are completed. Uh, so it's it's at the end of the process. Uh, previously, I was working at Allegro Group. Uh, yeah, you can find me on GitHub, Twitter, and, and LinkedIn. Uh, currently, also, I'm, I'm uh, working on the Stargate.io project at Datastacks. Uh, so you can check it out as well. Uh, so there is an old computer science saying that premature optimization is the root of all evil. And it has a solid background because it's accurate for a lot of use cases. Without any input data about expected traffic and SLA, it's hard to reason about your code and its required performance. Optimizing random paths in code in such a situation is like shooting in the dark. You will complicate your code without a sane reason. And let's start by finding and analyzing when premature optimization is evil. Often we are writing our application code, we don't have much input data regarding its expected traffic. And in the ideal world, we would always have the, the information about the expected throughput and maximum latency requirements. In reality, we often need to follow a more ad hoc approach. We are starting by writing software that is maintainable and easy to change. However, as we are writing the code, uh, we don't have strict performance requirements. And in such a case, optimizing our code upfront has too many unknowns. So when optimizing the performance of some code path, we are often increasing its complexity. And this additional complexity arises from the fact that we are changing the code to be performance optimized. And sometimes we need to write parts of it in a specific way. In those parts of the system, we are trading off its performance over complexity. And it may be co code complexity, but also maintenance or system complexity of the components that we are using. And without, uh, without the input data about the traffic, 
Oh, sorry. I have some problem. Yeah, it should be open. Yeah, so uh, let me get back to it. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, it, it may be called complexity, but also maintenance system and so on. And so without the input data about the traffic, it may turn out that the given code is not impacting the overall performance of our main workflow. And because of that, we introduce additional complexity without the benefit of increasing the performance. And another pitfall we may encounter is optimizing code based on false assumptions. And let's see how it's easy to make this mistake. So let's consider a simple scenario when we have a simple account entity for which we are building our processing pipeline. So we have this account with name and ID. Uh, yeah, the, and then we have the processing pipeline. So the simple code is using the stream API, as you may see, and hides quite many performance optimizations already. The stream abstraction work in a lazy way. It means that it will execute the filter operation that checks if the account ID matches the argument as long as there is no accounts found yet. And let's, let's maybe clarify the usage of find any and find first, because they are often used in the wrong context. The, the laziness is achieved by using find any, and this method will stop processing when any element is found. If we use the find first method, it would have the same behavior as the sequential processing approach. If this processing is split into parts, then find any may perform better because we don't care about ordering of processing. However, using find first will mean that the processing must be done in order and it slows down the processing pipeline. And this difference becomes more important when we are using parallel streams. So we created this code as the first approach, and it's important to note that we don't have any performance information at this point. The list of accounts that we are processing could contain a couple of elements, but it can also contain millions of elements. And without this knowledge, it's hard to optimize the performance of this processing. For the low number of accounts, our code will be good enough. For millions of elements, we may consider splitting the work into different threads. The one solution would be to create those threads manually, split the work into batches and submit it to, into multiple threads. We can leverage existing mechanisms that hide the creation of threads and split the work such as parallel streams. So let's assume that we are deciding to introduce performance optimization to our processing code. And we notice that the processing works in one thread. It means that we cannot split work and execute it concurrently leveraging all cores of our CPU. One of the possible optimizations that we can do is to use the work still algorithm. We would need to split the work into n independent stages. All input accounts will have n elements in it. Firstly, we'll split it into half, into two threads. At this point, at this point two threads will be responsible for processing half of the n accounts. Secondly, our code should do another split because not all threads are utilized. The work will be split into four of n accounts. At this point, every thread will be able to start the actual processing. And the split phase should split the accounts into as many parts as there are available threads or cores. Yeah, so the parallel stream method will split the work into n parts. It will use the internal fork join thread pool with a number of threads equal to number of cores minus one, but it, it looks simple, but it hides a lot of complexity. The most important change is that our code is multi-threaded now. It means that the processing should be stateless. We shouldn't modify any state from any processing method. Because we are using thread pool, we should monitor its usage and utilization. And another hidden complexity that the still algorithm has is the phase of splitting the work. This phase takes additional time, adding performance overhead to our code. The splitting phase, phases overhead can be higher, higher than the gain that we get from making it parallel. 
Because we base our optimization work on false or no assumptions, we cannot reason how this code will perform on the production. To validate if our performance optimization was efficient or not, we should write a performance benchmark validating both methods. So we assume that the processing would work for n accounts where n is equal to 10,000. Regardless if the number is based on the empirical data or our assumption, we should at least write a performance benchmark to validate if our optimization is valid. So the benchmarking code would generate n random accounts with IDs from 0 to 10,000. We can generate a random string using the UID class. The fork parameter states that all tests should be run in the same JVM and we'll be using the Java Micro Benchmark Harness JMH tool for benchmarking it. Before the actual processing logic, we should run a warm up that will allow JIT to optimize code paths. It is configured using uh, the warm up annotation. We will execute 10 iterations of measurements. This is good enough. The more iteration, the more repeatable results, of course, and we are interested in the average time that the method takes. The results will be reported using millisecond time units. Let's take a look at the benchmark initialization logic. So the base time method will execute the first version of our accounts finder logic. The parallel method will execute the improved version that is using parallel stream. So let's execute, uh, execute uh, the benchmark and see the uh, results. And please note that the exact number may differ on your machine. If you will uh, try to run it, I will provide uh, the code at the end of this presentation, but the overall trend will be the same. So when we execute the benchmark logic, we'll notice that performance of both solutions is almost the same. One of the examples run output would be like this. So the parallel processing might be slightly slower because of the split overhead needed before the actual work. If you increase the number of accounts, you will start noticing that the parallel version is slightly faster. Overall, the difference between both solutions for this assumptions regarding data, input data, will be negligible. And the parallel solutions performance result do not justify adding the additional complexity that arises from using a multi-threading solution. However, the code complexity doesn't increase whether you choose parallel or standard stream. The complexity is hidden in the internals of the parallel stream method. Yes, yeah, so let's, let's look at lessons learned from this example. So we assume that the code will be called for a specific number of elements. In such a context, the second version of our code doesn't perform better. The problem is that the number used to conduct the test were a guess. In a reward system, system it might turn out that the number of elements that will be processed will be substantially different, higher or lower. It means that we will have more empirical data that uh, if uh, that can be used to optimize the code, but this time based on real-world assumptions. In that case, we can get back to optimizing the code, but this time using correct, correct numbers. If you know upfront that the accounts will grow over time, you need to adapt your benchmarking code. Once you hit the threshold, you will notice that parallel streams will perform better than the standard stream method. It, in such a case, it won't be a premature optimization anymore. We looked at one aspect of the input information needed for useful performance optimizations. In real-world systems, we have a lot of code paths. Even assuming that we know n for all input processing, it may not be feasible to optimize all those paths. We should now how, know how often the given code path will be executed to decide if it's worth optimizing. There are code paths that are executed very rarely, like for example, initialization of our code. However, we have code paths that are executed for every user request or almost every. We'll be calling this code hot path. And op optimizing code on this path is often worth doing resulting in substantial performance improvement of the overall system. 
and in the next part of this presentation, we will learn how to reason about this hot path in your code. So in the previous part of, uh, of this presentation, we saw an example of optimization based on false assumptions. One of the essential data characteristics that are very useful when optimizing your code is knowing the input number of elements. It, it will be n. It may be the number of requests per second, number of files you need to read. Also, as we all know, an algorithm complexity can be calculated by knowing what an input number, number of element, this n, is. And we can pick the proper algorithm, but we can also estimate memory usage. And knowing n is vital, but not all code in our application has the same importance in real production systems. For example, let's consider a simple HTTP ap application that may have different endpoints executed more or less often. The first process request endpoint is exposing the main functionality of our application. It is executed for almost every client call and does the main work. Let's assume that this endpoint is executed by our clients 10,000 times per second. We also assume that n for both endpoints is calculated based on the empirical data or the SLA, so service level agreement, that our service will offer. So the data that we are using is based on assumptions, assumptions backed up with actual data. On the other hand, we have a different method that does more heavy work. The modify schema manipulates the data structure in the underlying database that this HTTP application is using. It is called very rarely because changing the schema is not a common task that clients are executing. Once the schema is changed, it will stay in the same structure for longer time. So let's assume that we have measured the 99th percentile of latency for both endpoints. That is 99% of requests are faster than the specific number. After some time, we will get the results concluding that the P99 latency for request process request is equal to 200 milliseconds. And for modify schema, P99 latency is 500 milliseconds. Uh, yeah, so the first conclusion will be less improved modified schema, but why? Yeah? If you will look only at those measurements without the context of the number of requests per second, we could conclude that we should start from optimizing the modified schema endpoint. When you add the context about the number of requests, it is easy to calculate that optimizing the process request endpoint will give us more overall resource and time savings. So for example, if we will be able to reduce P99 latency for requests by only 200 milliseconds, so 10%, we may get the overall reduction of latency equal to 200 milliseconds. So the value before optimization and after multiplied by number of requests. And however, even if you will optimize the modified schema endpoint twice to 250 milliseconds, we will get a substantially lower overall latency reduction that will be equal to 2,500 milliseconds. And based on those calculations, we can conclude that investing time in optimizing the endpoint that is called more often will result in 80 times more, more savings than optimizing the endpoint that takes more time to execute. The path that is executed for the majority of requests is called a hot path. And fighting and optimizing it is a crucial aspect if you want to optimize the performance of every application. And it turns out that in real-world systems, this pattern on unevenly distributed traffic between code paths in our application is happening very often. There were a lot of empirical study, studies that ended up as a part of principle that can simplify thinking about our systems. Let's take a look at this principle in the next slide. So there were studies of multiple systems like organization, work efficiency, and software systems that found very interesting characteristics for most of them. We'll analyze it in the context of software systems. It turns out that a small fraction of code delivers a substantial proportion of the value produced by our software. The proportions that were detected most often were 80% to 
It means that 80% of the value and work that our system is doing is delivered by only 20% of our code. <coughs> Sorry. And it can be presented by this, uh, this graph. So if we, if we had a linear behavior, it would mean that every code path in our code has the same import importance. In such a scenario, adding a new component to our system would mean that the value delivered to our clients increased proportionally. In reality, every system has a core functionality responsible for the core business and provides the most value. The rest of the functionalities that are not crucial, such as validation, handling edge cases, and handling failures, do not produce much business value. However, they may require 80% of the time and effort to build the whole system. Of course, the actual proportion will differ depending on the business domain and system. It may be 30 to 70% or even 10 to 90%. The actual number is not important. And what's the most important lesson from this characteristic? So we can conclude that optimizing the smaller parts of our code will impact most of our users. When creating a new system, we should have SLA requirements with an expected upper bound of traffic that our system can handle. Once we have those numbers, we can create performance tests that are simulating reward traffic, and then, in, as a consequence, we can detect and validate this hot path. So for example, let's assume that our service needs to provide uh, the SLA for handling 10,000 requests per second, and the average latency is 50 milliseconds. If you want to examine such a system by the performance tool, it's essential to set the correct, num correct number of threads, so number of concurrent users, to execute the request to a system under stress. If we, if we pick one thread, we would be able to run at most 20 requests per second, because we have a uh, total like 1000 milliseconds and we have average equal to 15, so we have 20 requests per second. And such a performance tool setup won't allow us to examine the system SLA because we need to handle 10,000 requests per second. So how many threads do we need? Uh, however, once we, once we know that the one thread can handle 20 requests per second, we can conclude that the total number of threads that we need. We can divide the expected number of requests per second by the number of requests that one thread can handle. It will tell us that we need 500 threads to saturate the traffic. Once we have the number, we can configure our benchmark tool accordingly. And also if the, st also if the stress tool is not able to create that many threads on one node, we can divide the traffic into n stress test nodes where each test node handles a portion of the traffic. For example, we may execute requests from four stress test nodes. In that case, each of those nodes will, will need to execute requests for 125 concurrent users, 500 time, uh, divided by four nodes. And please note that those calculations may be a bit different depending on the performance tool that you use. So if your performance tool is using an event loop, so non-blocking IO, you may execute more requests from one thread. In such a case, firstly, you need to measure the number of requests that this one thread can handle and adapt the rest of the calculations to that number accordingly. Finally, you should create a bit more threads that cal than calculated because the calculations are based on average latency. There might still be some outliers that will slow down the concurrent threads. To see how many outliers we have, we can look at the latency of higher percentiles, like P90, P95, P99, and so on, and so on. And due to that fact, we may multiply the total number of threads needed for average SLA by some factor, like for example, 1.5, to allocate some extra threads in the case of temporary slowdown of a system under stress. The next step that we can do is measure critical code paths regarding the number of invocation and the time that it takes. By having those numbers, we can detect the hot path and calculate how significant performance gains we can get from optimizing a small part of our code. And thanks to those characteristics of most of the systems that follow the Pareto principle, by optimizing our hot path, 
we can impact and deliver improvements for the majority of our clients. And we will apply this framework for optimizing a system that has a defined SLA. In the next part of this presentation, we will build uh, and understand the new system and its domain, and we'll try to optimize the hot path of it. Uh, as I, and again, uh, this is backed with all code, and also I will share this repo at the end. So let's say that we have a, a word service that has two functionalities exposed under two API endpoints. The first functionality that it offers is getting the word of the day. It calculates the offset specific to the current date and returns the word with an index equal to the offset. The second functionality is validating the word. The user is passing the word as a query parameter and scans the direct dictionary for its existence. It returns the information about it, its existence in the response button. The next couple of slides of this presentation will have a lot of code, and we don't need to dig very deep in this code, just enough to understand the service's basic functionality. So the word service is a core component of our system based on word service interface. The get of the day, uh, the, the get word of the day method does not take any arguments. It just returns the correct word. On the other hand, the word exists method takes uh, the word that should be checked and it returns if it exists or not. The first implementation of the word service is not trying to do any premature optimization as we don't have any numbers regarding SLA or traffic yet. The core functionality for getting word of the day is calculating the index for a given day. The logic is simple as it uses year and, the, and day of the year plus a multiplying factor to have a better distribution of, of returned words. And we are picking the multiplying factor to 100, but it can be an arbitrary number. The logic for calculating the word of the day is leveraging the scanner class that allows us to scan the file lazily. As long as you want the next line, we need to call the method that retrieves it. And once we are done processing, there is no need uh, to load more lines. The logic is quite simple. It iterates over the file as long as the line number index denoting the day's expected word is not found. As long as there are more lines, we are executing our logic. Finally, if the current processing index equals to the index for the expected word, we can return the word and finish processing. At the end of the processing, we are handling one edge case. If the index for the word of the day is too high, no word of the day is, uh, is returned. The second business functionality that our service is delivering is validation if the specific word exists. The logic for getting this information is similar to, to word of the day, but in case if the word doesn't exist, we need to iterate over the whole file. The word exists method tries to find the word passed as an argument. If the line loaded from the file equals the word argument, we can return true. It means that the word does not exist. Finally, if the word was not found after iterating the whole file, we are returning false. The logic for word exists is not optimized as we did not define the SLA yet. We don't have a performance test to find the performance of the current solution yet as well. Finally, we can expose our logic under an API endpoint. Both, both functionalities are exposed as HTTP endpoints. I will not show that code here, but it's pretty simple. And for those that would like to take a look at it, I will link to a complete source code at the end of this presentation. So let's assume that our traffic estimations and SLA states that the word of the day endpoint will serve one request per second. On the other hand, the word exists will be called more frequently, 20 requests per second. Straightforward calculations will show us that it even exceeds the values from the original Pareto principle. It means that the word exists functionality serves 95% of the user's request. Before we start optimizing the endpoint, we should create a performance test for both endpoints to give us latencies. By knowing both numbers of requests and latencies, we can calculate the overall benefit 
of optimizing one functionality or the other. We'll use the Gatling tool for performance testing. <coughs> we want to model two performance test scenarios. The first one should target worth of the day endpoints and execute one request per second. The simulations using Gatling are written using the Scala programming language. Every simulation needs to extend the simulation class. Uh, the scenario for getting word of the day is straightforward, as we can see. We need to execute a get request for a given endpoint. Every request will be executed in the context of uh, localhost words. If you want to deploy the word application on a separate server, you need to change this URL, of course. And our API endpoint accepts and produces a JSON format. The benchmarking, the benchmarking scenario executes the get HTTP request on the word of the day endpoint. We are expecting the results to be equal to 200 HTTP response code. Any other, co any other code will be treated as an error. The second scenario is similar, but the HTTP GET request needs to send the word to validate as an HTTP parameter. Because of that, we need to fit the scenario with words that we want to validate. Our example words.csv file contains the following words, as you can see, word, uh, bigger, and so on. Please note that, the, that we have the word bigger from the beginning of the dictionary. We also have the word uh, presence that is in the middle of it. Finally, we have a zoo word that resides at the end of a dictionary. Besides that, we have two words that do not exist. They will trigger a full file scan. The words.csv file is used by the validate scenario and passed as the query parameter to the API endpoint. The feeder will fetch words from words.csv and execute them randomly. Finally, the scenario is executing a GET request with the word query parameter. Once you have defined scenarios, we should inject them to the execution engine and specify the expected traffic. The first scenario is executing one request per second. Uh, the five-day scenario responsible for 95% of clients' requests is executing 20 requests per second. And let's analyze the performance results for both scenarios. So the word of the day scenario performance seems fair, fair enough, fair good enough. Uh, all requests uh, for the word of the day endpoint succeeded below 800 milliseconds. The P99 latency is equal to 361 milliseconds. Let's now take a look at the results for validate words endpoint. This endpoint executed the majority of requests. The majority of requests have latency higher than 1,200 milliseconds. The 99 percentile is almost five seconds. By looking at those both rates results, we can see that word exist performance is problematic. Fixing it will impact 95% of our customers. There is no need to prematurely optimize the word of the day as the performance, performance is good enough and it impacts only 5% of our customers. But let's calculate the performance impacts of both endpoints using the formula from the beginning of this presentation. The word of the day uh, average latency is uh, 360 milliseconds, but we have only one request uh, per second. And on the other hand, uh, the word exists, we have 5,000 uh, milliseconds, that was the this percentile. So yeah, uh, we can multiply that and we will get a total uh, time. We can calculate that the word of the day is responsible for less than 1% of our service requests handling work. Once we have these calculations, it is obvious where we should focus our optimization efforts. The word exist logic takes 99.7% of the total work workload of our system. So once we know that the word exist uh, endpoint is problematic, we need to get information from our code's lower level. We need to understand what parts of the code take most of the processing time. We can get this information by measuring the code that is on the hot path. Let's see how can we achieve it. So initially, the code for uh, validating if the word exists was simple and had no optimization. 
we didn't know at we didn't know at this point uh, that optimization may be necessary. Now we have an input uh, number regarding the number of requests that our service will handle. The performance test test showed that we have a problem with latency latencies on the endpoint that serves 95% of our users' requests. The Gatling tests were black box, meaning that we get the information on, on how the specific endpoint performs, but we don't have any internal information about the most time-consuming parts of the system. The word exists method contains of two main functionalities. The first one is loading the file uh, containing words to check. The second one, the scan phase, that tries to find the actual word does, does exist or not. We can wrap both stages into separate timers to measure every invocation of those methods and give us more detailed information about the performance. We'll create two timers. The first timer will measure the time that the loading of the file takes. The second timer will measure scan time. How long does it take to find if the word is valid or not? The timer will be executed for every operation and it will give percentiles, average, and also the number of invocation. You can measure the code at any granularity level that suits your needs. Measuring every code path might impact the processing log logic's overall performance, so you should use it carefully. And once your logic is optimized, you may uh, decide to remove some or even all measurements. So after rerunning Gatling performance tests, uh, we can visit uh, if our, our application exposes metrics. Uh, so we can visit metrics endpoint uh, to see those at metrics exposed uh, there. And we will uh, find the section dedicated to load file. It will have data for, for percentiles and we are most interested with 99 percentiles. So let's take a look at it. Uh, so these results are reported in seconds, and we can see that 99 percentile of load file action is equal to 7 milliseconds. The load file operation is not causing the performance problems that we detected using the Gatling test. You also have a count showing that uh, number of invocation of the specific code, and using that you can compare different code paths and see when most of the time is spent. It may be handy, handy if you don't have predefined information about expected traffic or SLA. If you have that information, you can use the metrics to validate your assumptions. In such a scenario, you can deploy the application to production with metrics and calculate, they will calculate and aggregate which code paths were invoked most of the time. By having this information, you can detect the hot path and focus on improving its performance. Let's take a look at the scan timer, so the second operation. And we can see that the 99 percentile is almost five second, seconds. It seems that we found the underlying cause of our performance problems. The scan operation takes a long time to execute and it takes most of the request processing time. Once we detected the underlying cause, we can start optimizing the whole path that needs to be optimized. Of course, in real world systems, you may have more complex logic with different, different uh, executions that con consist the hot path, the whole hot path. And in such a case, you can also measure each of those to find which uh, one uh, generates the most of the, of the latency, right? In the next slides, uh, we will optimize our application's hot path and validate if our improvements result in better performance. We might also consider uh, implementing uh, JMH tests, asserting our cost performance at a lower level and getting faster feedback after our changes. The faster feedback would be possible because we don't need to run the whole Gatling performance suite every time we experiment with the implementation. I will not demonstrate JMH tests in this presentation but because it will be too long. And if you are interested uh, how this step can be done, uh, I will. It, it is covered in my book, chapter five. Uh, so please refer to it. So once we know where the problem li lies, we can start optimizing the word exists code path. We need to reduce the time spent on the scan phase. Let's assume that the word uh, file that we are using for checking words existent is static and doesn't change. This assumption is very important in the context of our logic. 
It means that once we check if the word exists, the value will not change in the future. Let's implement the solution based on the cache and measure its performance. We need to construct a cache that will call the existing word exists method if the given word is not present. We are setting the default eviction time to five minutes. It can be adapted, adapted once we have more data about production traffic distribution. We are constructing the cache where a word is a key and the information about its existence is value. We are using Guava loading cache. When the specific word was not accessed by the eviction time, it will be removed from the cache. So we are ready to run the gutting performance test again and let's see uh, results right now. So we can see that the performance of our solution increased substantially. The latency 99 99 percentile is equal to 65 milliseconds. It is almost 80 times faster than the initial solution. And but that's not the end of our of our uh, optimizations and calculations. So once you perform your optimization, you should recalculate the impact that the specific uh, part of the code take. Our latency was reduced to 95 milliseconds now. So we can use the second section, uh, the formula from the second uh, part of this presentation that I've shown before to calculate the performance impact of the word of the day and word exist logic. The word exist traffic is 20 requests per second with P99 equal to 65. So we can, uh, we can multiply those. And the word of the day has one request and uh, latency was 360, so right now it will be also equal to 360. And we can uh, we can uh, calculate the percentage of the traffic generated by both endpoints after our optimizations. And we can do it by calculating the traffic for the word of the day. So our calculations show now that the word of the day traffic is generating 21% of the workload on our system. The word exists is responsible for the rest 79% of the workload. We reduced it from 99.7. The word exists is still responsible for most of the workload. However, as we calculated before, it impacts 95% of users requests. After our optimization, the word of the day that affects 5% of our users requests take 21% of the processing resources. If we seek further optimizations, we should calculate the possible time saving using uh, formulas from this presentation. Let's assume that we can further improve the performance of both endpoints by 10%. For the word of the day, it will give us 36 milliseconds of time savings because we have only one request per second. And improving the word exist performance by further 10% will give us 130 milliseconds of time savings because we have 20 requests per second. Uh, yeah. So however, it may turn out that optimizing the word exist performance by further 10% is infeasible or hard to achieve. We can calculate that only optimizing the word of play by 40% will give us more time savings than optimizing the word exists by 10%. If optimizing the endpoint by 30% is more feasible than optimizing the word exists that is on the hot path by 10%, we may decide that we should focus on the non-hot path optimization. However, as you notice, optimizing uh, the hot path gives us more benefits with lower efforts. In real life, optimizing the specific code paths by 10% is more realistic than 40%. So my example in, in this presentation was quite simple, but I want to show you the whole framework, right? From the beginning, when we uh, had a data about a number of input requests, then we, then we collected uh, data about latency, uh, we calculated which paths in our code are most significant, which path is a hot path and which are less significant. Also, I've showed you that it's based on the empirical studies uh, from Pareto principle. Next, I show you one example how we can uh, go uh, deeper in, within our code 
by measuring uh, uh, specific parts of the hot path. And then once we have measurements, we can optimize our efforts on, on a various small part of the code. And we may be sure that those optimization will give us overall benefits that are greater than optimizing any other path in our code. And this is just a, this is a framework for like finding uh, what should be optimized and not investing a lot of time and uh, you know person's times, engineers' time, time, but also having those uh, results, uh, measurable results, and overall uh, performance improvement of our application. Uh, yeah. So, so if you like you like this uh, presentation and this one approach that I've presented, uh, you may also like my book about software mistakes, trade-offs, and decisions. I uh, wrote it with uh, John Skeet, uh, so he authored a couple of chapters there as well. Uh, each chapter is basically uh, focusing on different aspects of systems. Uh, yeah, this, this presentation is based mainly on chapter five about performance, but also you will find uh, analysis on consistency, availability of distributed systems, uh, delivery guarantees, and data locality, and, and more. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm closing here a discount code, so you can use it. It's it's thirty five percent discount for this book. And yeah, that's that's the last slide. So thank you for this presentation. Uh, and the code from this presentation and the entire book is is open sourced. You don't need to buy a book to to access that. Uh, you can go to this repository if you are interested. Uh, in running those examples, performance benchmarks using Gaplink, JMH, uh, uh, measuring using metrics framework, uh, you can go to chapter five and experiment with it, uh, run it, and so on. So, time for questions if there are any. Hey, Thomas, I'm back. So, while waiting for the questions of the participants, I, I have another question for you. So I'll start uh, the rounds with the questions. Um, we have seen that you're optimizing code, but usually services are calling other services and you might have also some um, issues or latency in the network and so on. Um, are there also special approaches how you would deal with that or you would use the same approach to actually tackle these problems as well? Yeah. Uh, good question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the microservices architecture, uh, and not only in microservices, but we need to call. Sometimes we need to call a couple of services to uh, aggregate the final result. Uh, yeah, and all of those uh, latencies of external services will also be uh, accumulated in our response. But using this approach, we can basically do the same. So, uh, finding the hot path. Uh, so uh, if, if our application is exposing an endpoints uh, and we don't have a lot of time, but we want to improve the overall performance, we can use this approach to find the most important code path. And then, for example, treat each uh, external service call as this, this stage that should be measured. So I would recommend to measure every invocation to other services. Uh, yeah, it's latency, uh, number of requests and so on. And mm -hmm. the way we measure that, it will give us uh, the information which uh, external service is the most problematic one and maybe when we should focus our efforts. Also, we can, of course, in improve this performance by by uh, executing requests in, in parallel or uh, some other advanced, advanced techniques like uh, speculative execution, but we need to know the, uh, that it will be worth the effort once we have the data backing up that our uh, guesses or assumptions uh, that this specific service is slow uh, we can we can do this right but we need to collect that data somehow so uh it looks also like you're you're starting the measurement actually from where you are right now and try to improve there but what if some more data gets added to the database and makes the system slower it's 
hard to predict, right? And you would have, may have to make more assumption on this. Or how do you see this? Uh, so at which stage? Uh, so uh, could you elaborate more about this adding to the database? So I mean, the thing is like if users start using your services, they may a data and then just because of that, it becomes slow as well because there's more data in the database and there are like yes. other things. And so the question is like, we, we just like measured once, have a look at this, but is there also like a way on our approach that you could find out that things are changing over time? Like, like it gets slower over time or like you have this continuous, I yes, guess, yes. continuous measurement going on or. Yes, for those crucial, crucial uh, resources like database. Uh, yeah, uh, we have different read, read, write patterns and so on. Uh, so uh, also we should measure, like wrap uh, at least maybe at some higher granularity, write paths, read paths, as uh, so maybe have some scan queries and so on and uh, have those metrics uh, out, out there. And also the whole infrastructure for aggregating those metrics, right? So maybe send them to, to Prometheus or Victoria metrics or social like that. And also have the graphical representation in Grafana that will allow us to track back in time, right? So we can, uh, we can see like mm -hmm. one week of the data and see the trend, right? Without that, it's, it's hard to uh, see if someone was a broken from the beginning or was it uh, broken is it uh, broken like from two days because uh, there is like, more data in the database so I, I would recommend to treat metrics as a persistent uh, also persistent data not transient transient but have the storage for them mm -hmm. um so just like out of curiosity um, do you know many projects or products or software, as, um, so cloud software services, uh, which are actually doing this? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, each each project that I was, uh, I've been part of of, of it. Uh, the measurements, metrics, and measurements were were more of the one of the most important aspects when operationalizing it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's for me, it's not production ready until we are, uh, we are measuring everything that should be measured, uh, including, uh, external calls, latencies. If we have cash, uh, caches, right. Uh, we, we should measure its size, uh, heat rate, uh, miss rate and so on. Uh, so that's for sure is, is a crucial aspect of it. If, if someone wants to have an example of it, I, I would recommend just go to the Stargate, uh, GitHub Stargate uh, repository, this project that I'm, I'm right now uh, working on. Uh, and we have uh, quite much APIs there supported, like gRPC, uh, gRPC uh, Document API, GraphQL, and so on. And each of those APIs are really heavily measured at, at uh, different stages, at least per, higher percentiles, uh, max latencies, average latencies, uh, throughput is, is a must, right? Mm -hmm. And what well, this framework that I showed is like, when we have throughput information, uh, latency information, it's, it's all, all that we need, right? Having that we can make a decision based on, on like basic data. On data, data. yes, exactly. Well, that's great. So um, I was just like pinging um, the participants actually to to add questions again. And uh, we have one in the Q&A section, so I'll read it for you. You're using micro benchmarks to measure performance of a system. Isn't this kind of outdated when we have flight recorder available as well as other excellent profilers like your kit? Yes, uh, so I've I've shown here I've shown a couple of it was not only micro benchmarks like we have Gatling that was more end to end uh, black box performance testing. Uh, yeah, so once we have we detected that some code path is problematic, of course we can uh, the good uh, approach would be to use some kind of a profiling. I showed this uh, metrics uh, and adding metrics. That was uh, one solution. The other one would be just to enable profiling, flight recording. 
that will give us uh, the nice uh, mm -hmm. overview of the system. But once we, we detected that something is problematic, how do you uh, how do you pick a different solution, right? Uh, if if we, for example, if you find out that the specific methods uh, from a sp some kind of a library is problematic, that's the point where um, we can start and we can develop JMH macro benchmark for this specific implementation, and then create a different implementation, maybe using different library or a different approach. Uh, also write a second benchmark for JMH. It will be mainly uh, the benefit of it is this faster feedback loop, right? If you're experimenting with the code at the low level and we we detected already using profiler or matrix uh, where the problem lies at, at the lower granularity level, uh, experimenting with the code and being able, able to run uh, JMH benchmarks is fast, right? We can run those benchmarks every minute and so on. And if we are debugging the application and to end sometimes uh, the feedback will be will be longer, right? Uh, so we need to start the whole application, start uh, performance benchmark through that, like JMeter or Gatling, then uh, start profiling, uh, start you know, flight, flight recorder, for example, uh, then gather the data. So micro benchmarks are, are useful once you uh, suspect where the problem may lie, right? So for example, you are using some uh, parsing library, right? Uh, so some J J JSON structure, and uh, it turns out that uh, profiling shows that specific part, specific part of the JSON processing takes a lot of time. So at this stage, uh, you can isolate it in your code, uh, try uh, create macro benchmark for it, cry, create alternative implementation, maybe using different library, and create also micro benchmark. Compare those if if the if you found the better solution, you can uh, use the new code and repeat the whole procedure from end to end testing, black box testing, performance testing, and see if it yield uh, proper results. Results. I also think, um, but that's my personal opinion. Depending on the tool, you need to connect maybe into a cloud instance, and then actually you don't have like TCP ports open or so. So um, like the metrics you were using before would be the option like how to capture those information when you want to measure inside the cloud, right? Yes, yes. Sometimes, so, sometimes the performance problem may be, problems may be specific to an environment, right? In which yes, you are exactly. your application. And if, you, if it's not easy to replicate it in the local environment, uh, yeah, it's, it may be hard. And yeah, sometimes you, you are not able to, to connect to or debug the remote application. In that case, this, uh, the metrics will help uh, to guide you to the place where the problem may, may lie. Have you been working with proxies as well to measure um, some performance? like for requests and response or like slow, slow applications? Uh, yeah, so could you, uh, do you have something, uh, some example or general? No, I don't have something in mind, but actually like um, in Kubernetes with Zycar, you could like hook in and get all the information because sometimes you have the issue that it's not even your code, which is slow, right? And you cannot change it. And you just like want to see where the problem is to provide more information. Yes, that would be one of the approach. Also, the useful, uh, useful uh, use case for such a proxy would be to to also simulate some kind of a delay between system uh, to see uh, right to to see how your system responds in such a case mm -hmm. that that the external system is problematic. Great, thanks a lot, Thomas, and also for the the talk now or for the chat. Uh, we don't have more Q&A questions, so I would like to um, fade out, go to my slides and we'll like also explain that the participants from tonight can win a book of, of yours because I got the code um, and we will do a raffle. But first, we want to say thank you to you, obviously, but also to all the participants who joined like online right now. And then also to our sponsors we have from the Java user group, which makes this possible. 
but also the people in the background, like Ursula or Markus helping out with technology and organization of all the things as usual. And um, we have our videos on YouTube. You probably know that already. So actually like um, subscribe to our channel, use the notification bell, and you will be notified usually Sunday morning with the new talks from the week, right? And that means like, Tomas, your talk will be there also roughly Sunday around 10 o'clock. We also have a Slack community. So if you want to get in touch with us, use the chance, um, make your account there and get in touch. And obviously, as I just said, provide us feedback also about the presentation from Tomas. And this time we have a special offer because we can give away the book for free for one person. And obviously, like every month, we also do a raffle on an IntelliJ license. So it's actually worth it to provide us feedback. Great. Thank you very much for joining and looking forward to see you in real life once it's possible again. Thanks. Thank for you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.